this chapter, we're going to discuss the electronic structure of the atoms. By the end of this chapter, we'll be able to calculate the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation given its frequency or its frequency given its wavelength. Also, you'll be able to order the common kinds of radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum according to their wavelength or energy. You will be able to explain what photons are and be able to calculate their energies given their frequency or wavelength. Also, you will be able to explain how li uh, line spectra relate to the idea of quantized energy, states of electrons in atoms. You will calculate the wavelength of a moving object. And finally, you will explain how the uncertain principle limits how precisely we can specify the position and the momentum of a subatomic particle such as electrons. This chapter is all about electronic structure, the arrangement and energy of electrons. But we're going to start by talking about waves. And it may seem odd to start by talking about waves. However, the e extremely small particles have pr properties that can only be explained in this manner. So we're going to see the uh, matter perspective, but also the, the, the waves perspective of these structures. So let's talk about waves. Here we have a wave, and the distance between this crest and this crest as those peaks are known as the wavelength. The distance from here to here is the wavelength from those weak uh, wave peak. To understand the electronic structure of atoms, one must understand the nature of electromagnetic radiation. The distance between corresponding points on adjacent waves is the wavelength, and most of the time is represented by this Greek symbol that is lambda. So the lambda is uh, also the wave wavelength. The number of waves passing a given point per unit of time is the frequency, and the frequency is represented by this Greek letter that is nu. For waves, basically we have here two types of waves. We can see this one that has basically this form, and it's the same time as this one. This basically is time. Okay, we can see the black line represent the line. Uh, the, the black line represents time, and for this time, you can see that this from this point to this point is a cycle. Okay, from this point to this point is a cycle. So we can see that we can go one and two cycles. Okay, using this wavelength. This wavelength is shorter than this one, so let's see how many cycles we can do in the same time. So we can go one, we can go two, we can go three, and we can go four cycles. So in the same time, we can have four cycles at this uh, wavelength, and for this wavelength, we can just have two cycles. So for waves traveling at the same velocity, the longer the wavelength, the smaller the frequency. We saw here that but to this wavelength, it was just four, uh, two cycles, while for this frequency, the uh, wavelength that it was smaller, the frequency was higher. If the time associated with the lines to the left is one second, then the frequency would be two cycles per second for this one and four cycles per second for this one. That will be the frequency for these examples. So most of the time is cycle per uh, per uh, second that is time. So for this wavelength, the frequency is two cycles per second, and for the sec uh, the the, low, the the one in the bottom is four cycles per second. Here we have the electromagnetic radiation, and this basically is the visible region. In this point, we have also this other type of frequency: the gamma rays, the X rays, ultraviolet infrared, microwaves, and radio frequency. And we can see that the wavelength increase from left to right. Most of the time, the unit that we use is meter. Okay, so the wavelength, a wavelength increase from left to right, while the frequency increase from right to left. Okay, so they are basically uh, inverse proportional, okay, between them. When one increase, the other one decrease. 
So all electromagnetic radiation travels at the same velocity. The speed of the light, that is C, is 3 times 10 power of 8 meters per second. And this is the equation of the speed of the light. The speed of the light is equal to lambda or wavelength time frequency. So that's why it is inversely because the speed of the light always is going to be the same. So if you increase this one, this must decrease. If you decrease this one, this one must increase. Okay, so that's why that relation between them. So the yellow light given off by a sodium vapor lamp used for public lighting has a wavelength of 589 nanometers. What is the frequency of this radiation? So we have wavelength, we need to look for the frequency. And we have this formula, that is the speed of the light, that can relate that. Okay, we're given here the wavelength of the radiation and asked to calculate this frequency. So the relationship between the wavelength and the frequency is given by the equation of this speed of the light. We can solve for frequency and use the values of lambda and the speed of the light to obtain a numerical answer. Okay, so we have the speed of the light, this value, okay, and we know that the equation um, is C times frequency uh, times lambda. But we can then rearrange to obtain the frequency. So frequency is going to be equal to the speed of the light divided by the wavelength. So we have the speed of the line and we have the wavelength here. Now we can convert that in the first step here. We have the speed of the light and we have the wavelength. But also the only thing is that we have these units that are of length unit. This one is in meter and this is in nanometer. So we can need to change from nanometers to meters so we can cancel the meters here. So we use the definition of one nanometer. One nanometer is equal to 10 to a, minus, a power of minus nine meter. And in this way we can cancel nanometer to nanometer and meter with meter. And at the end we're going to have the units of frequency or cycles per seconds. Okay, that this is the unit of frequency as we saw before. Okay, so once again we have the frequency. We want to need to determine the frequency is equal to the speed of the light divided by the lambda because this is the rearrange of the equation that the speed of the light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Okay, so we rearrange that equation so we can calculate the frequency and the definition or the result is the speed of the light divided by the wavelength. So this is the speed of the light that we know that value is a constant, always going to be the same value. And the wavelength for this specific yellow light is 589 nanometers. But we have the units, even though they are the same instead of the of the um, the, the main unit is meter, but this one is using the uh, prefixes or prefix of nano. So we need to cancel this unit of nanometer to, and also the meter, uh, the unit of meter. So we can use the relationship between meters and nanometers, and we can cancel now those units. So we can just obtain the second at the end. The frequency is cycles per second. So the high frequency is reasonable because of the short wavelength. The units are proper because the frequency has the units of frequency per second, or S minus 1. The wave nature of light does not explain how an object can glow when its temperature increases. This is due uh, basically uh, to energy. Okay, so basically the wave by itself, it doesn't explain uh, the why it glows. It glows because of the energy. The energy has also, um, in, in this case, was uh, defined by Max Planck, that the energy comes in packets that are called quanta or singular quantum. So it's a package basically of energy that is known as quanta. That means that when you need to go from one step to another, you need a specific energy to go from this step to this one. So that uh, that's a package of energy, a specific one that is called a quanta. It's just like that energy that you need to reach the next step. Okay, and always because you are, you are assuming that all of them are the same step, you have the same specific energy that you need to use for each step. So it's called the quanta. The photoelectric effect it was developed by Einstein. Einstein used the quanta to explain this effect. Each metal has a different energy at which eject electrons. So the electrons can be removed from the metals by um, hitting with a specific energy. 
and it sees that different energies can remove uh, or eject electrons. At lower energy, electrons are not emitted. So he concludes that energy is proportional to frequency. So energy is equals to the H, that is the Planck's, Planck's constant, and nu, that is the frequency. So energy is directly proportional to frequency. As higher the frequency, higher the energy. So that means that because the frequency and the wavelength is inverse, uh, proportional, that the with a higher wavelength, you have a lower energy. And with a lower wavelength, you have a higher energy. Okay, because it's the same relation between energy and the, the wavelength as the frequency with the wavelength. So energy is proportional to frequency. As higher frequency, higher energy. As lower frequency, lower energy. But it's inverse with the wavelength. As higher energy, the lower the wavelength. As lower the energy, higher or larger the wavelength. And this basically is the constant, the value of the constant of Planck's constant. So calculate the energy of a photon of yellow light that has a wave of 589 nanometers. Our task is to calculate the energy, okay, by using the uh, equation that we saw before, but that equation was in frequency. So first we need to change from wavelength to frequency. We need to convert this wavelength to frequency using the, um, the same that we used before, the same equation as, as example 6.2 that, 6 that we did before, we obtained there the frequency. And then that frequency, we can uh, use this uh, um, formula, and we can multiply by the Planck constant to obtain the energy. So as we saw in example 6.2, this is the frequency okay, of this uh, uh, yellow light at that wavelength. And now this frequency, we can put it here in this equation. So we can multiply by the uh, Planck constant. We have the uh, frequency obtained by this calculation and now this will be the energy of this wavelength. Let's talk about the atomic emissions. Another mystery in the early 20th century involved the emission spectra observed from energy emitted by atoms and molecules. We have for example for neon this kind of emission, this kind of light, and for hydrogen, these other colors. Okay, so we have basically different colors for, in this case, different atoms. And also, it has been found that we have continuous and line spectrum. So for definition, basically this one is a continuous spectrum. For atoms and molecules, one does not observe a continuous spectrum as one gets from a white light. So the white light produces a continuous spectrum. You don't see here any interruption between the colors. Goes from purple to basically red, orange and red. Okay, all the way without inter uh, interruptions. Now, the only aligned spectrum of this discrete wavelength is observed when we have elements. Each element has a unique line spectrum. This instead, of, this is basically the same range from here. Okay, but as you can see, instead of, uh, of see a continuous spectrum, you, you, you can just see line spectrums. This wavelength, this one, and this one, just, you can see just four lines for hydrogen. For neon, you're going to see a much a larger number of lines, but it's the same uh, concept, the same characteristic. You can't see a continuous. You're going to see line spectrum for the elements. And the question is, why? So let's try to expl explain first the most simple, that is the hydrogen. In the hydrogen spectrum, as we mentioned, we have just four lines. And Johann Balmer in 1885 discovered a simple formula relating the four lines to integers. integers. And Johannes uh, Radberg advanced this also formula. And they established that the equation is gonna, was this. One over the wavelength is gonna be equal to the Radberg uh, constant times 1 over n square and 1 square minus n2 square. Niels Bohr explained why this mathematical relationship works. Okay, so in this case, the n represent 
the energy levels. We're going to see that in a little bit later. But this basically represents the states, the energy where, where the electrons are. Okay, Because the emission of the light is going to be due to the transition of the position of the electrons when they jump from one uh, energy to another energy state from one level to another one. We're going to uh, talk a little bit uh, of that uh, in a few slides. So let's talk about the Bohr model. Niels Bohr adopted the Planck's assumption and explained this phenomena in this way. Number one, electrons in an atom can only occupy certain orbits. These orbits represent energy. Okay, so they are in specific orbits around the atom. Electron in permitted orbits has, have specific allowed energies. These energies will not be radiated from the atom. So if you're going to be in a specific orbit, that orbit has specific energy, and you need to have this energy to be at that level. Okay, it's the same as when we talk about doing the steps. If you have enough step to get to the next one, you're going to be in the next or in the next step. So it's the same with the elect electrons. The electrons to be in specific orbitals, uh, uh, they need to have that energy to be in that specific orbit. Energy is only absorbed or emitted in such a way as to move an electron from one allowed energy state to another. The energy is defined as E equals to the constant Planck and the frequency. So this means that if you want to go from one orbit to another one, if, it's in the, if it has a higher energy, you need to gain enough, absorb enough energy to be in that next orbit. If you want to go to a, an orbit lower than where you are, you need to release or emit that specific amount of energy where you can have the energy associated with that level. You, can, you can't be in a lower level with more energy than it requires to be in that orbit. So as we can see here, we have basically one electron. We can have, for example, one electron in, in the ground level 1, n equals to 1, and we want to reach the n equals to 2. So this is the energy required that the electrons need to absorb so we can reach the second orbit. Also, it can reach if it can reach the third or, or uh, orbit if it gains or absorbs this amount of energy from this point to this point, it can reach here. But if it has energy enough to reach at this point, it can't reach either this one or, or this one. Okay. The same thing happens when if you want to go from the orbit number two to orbit one. So you need to release all this amount of energy so we can reach this point. You can also go from orbit 4 to 2. If, if one electron wants to release that energy enough to uh, up reach number 2, it needs to release or emit this amount of energy from this point to this point because this represents energy here in the left side of the axis. So the Bohr model here we can see all the different kind of emissions uh, or, or movement of electrons from orbit 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, from two to four, you can see this represents basically the energy that needs to be absorbed if you want to go up or release is the same amount of energy because uh, it is going to be this energy is constant between orbits. Okay, so the energy absorbed or emitted from the process of electrons, promotion or demotions can be calculated by the following equation: the uh, uh, change in uh, delta E is equal to minus h, that is the Planck constant times t, that is the speed of the light, and times the rh, that is the Rydberg constant, times, in parenthesis, 1 over nf2, um, nf square minus ni square. n means the orbit, and f the final. So this is the final orbit square, and i means initial, represent initials. So this is the initial level, okay, and square. <clears throat> Now, this model has some limitations because it only works for hydrogens, for the element of hydrogen. Classical physics would result in an electron failing into the positively charged nucleus. Bohr simply assumed it would not. So circular motion is not wave 
like in nature. But there are very important ideas from this model. Uh, this model points that are incorporated into the current atomic model include the following. Number one, that electrons exist only in certain discrete energy levels. And number two, that energy is involved in the transition of an electron from one level to another. So in, a, in our known atomic model, okay, we have these two points that come from the uh, Bohr model. Now let's talk about the wave nature of matter. Louis de Broglie theorized that if light can have material properties, matter should exhibit wave properties. And he demonstrated that the relationship between mass and wavelength had this equation. Okay, so the uh, um, wavelength is equal to Planck over mass, and this is the uh, composition that incorporate matter, mass, because the matter has mass, okay? So that's why now instead of wavelength, we are talking about the wave nature of the matter because we're incorporating here a concept that is, um, that is the mass that is part of matter. So we have Planck over mass times the frequency. So the wave nature of light is used to produce basically these electron micrographs that we can see here. This is a basic picture of um, some um, metal in electron micrograph technique. Now let's talk about the uncertainty, uncertainty principle. Heisenberg showed that the more precisely the momentum of a particle is known, the less precisely it is its position is known. So in other words, the electrons, the position of the electron is really, really hard to establish. It, it is basically unknown. We can have an idea, but we can't precisely say the electron is right here at this point of time. So to explain how today we know where that electron is, we need to call what is known as the quantum mechanic that was developed by a mathematical known as Erwin Schrödinger. He developed a mathematical treatment into which both uh, the wave and particle nature of matter could be incorporated. This is known as the quantum mechanic and basically is uh, that instead of where to know specifically where, where the electron is, we're talking about probabilities. Where is more probable to find the electron? So we don't know the specific location, but we know in a specific uh, the specific area where you had going to have a higher probability to have that electron. The solution of Schrodinger uh, equation, wave equation, is designed by a lower Greek psi. Okay, so this basically is the uh, equation or the representation of the equation, the psi. And the square of the wave equation, psi squared, gives the electron density or probability of where an electron is likely to be at any given time. So that's the result of the wave equation, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's wave equation. It allows us to know where is the higher probability to find the electron. As in here, when, when you can see this intense blue, that's the higher probability to find the electron in that region. Where you find low dots, that means that you have a low probability of finding the electron in this region. So the highest probability is going to be around this point. So solving the wave equation gives a set of wave functions known also as orbitals and their corresponding energy. So each orbital obtained from the wave equation has a specific energy. Each orbital describes a spatial distribution of electron density, and an orbital is described by a set of three quantum numbers. Each orbital is going to be described by a set of three quantum numbers. The first one is known as the principal quantum number, also represented by an N, and this number describes the energy level on which the orbital resides or is. The values of n are integers. They are one or larger than one. And this corresponds to the values in the Bohr model. So you start with uh, n1 and then 2, 3, 4, and you just go all, all over until 
infinite probabilities to the uh, possible orbitals. The next one is known as the angular momentum quantum number. So the first one was the principal quantum number, and this one is known as the angular momentum quantum number, also represent, all, all, all represented by the letter L. This quantum number defines the shape of the orbital. Allowed values of L are integers ranging from 0 to n minus 1. So the first value is going to be 0, and then 1, 2, 3, oh, 1, so on. We use letter designation to communicate the different values of L and therefore the shapes and types of orbitals. So if you have, for example, a value of 0, the letter is going to be S. If you obtain a quantum, a angular momentum quantum number of 1, your letter is going to be P. If you have an L of 2, the letter is going to be D. If it's going to be a 3, it's going to be F. And for 4, is going to be G. So they have a specific... Uh, the, the values of L has a specific uh, letter assigned. The third one is known as the magnetic quantum number, R or ML. The magnetic quantum number describes the three-dimensional orientation of the orbital. Allowed values of ML are integers rank, ranging from minus 1, minus L to L going through 0. Okay, so we're going to have uh, uh, different values from minus L, okay, or basically minus the angular momentum, to the angular momentum positive value going through zero. So therefore, on any given energy energy level, there can be up to one s orbital. Okay, if we have the the one, we're gonna have one s orbital. For we're gonna have three p orbitals, five d orbitals, seven f orbitals, and so forth. Orbitals with the same value of n form an electron shell. Different orbitals types with a shell are subshells. Okay, so orbitals with the same value of n form an electron shell, and different orbital types within a shell are subshells. So we are going to have here a table, and this one we have basically. A, for example, the first one, the principal quantum number n is 1. So the possible uh, angular momentum is going to be basically 0, okay, because we're going to start n minus 1, and n minus 1 is 0. So it's going to be the ml is going to be 0. And for 0, the letter representation is s. So that's why you can describe the subshell as 1, because we are in the shell 1 with the uh, angular momentum of s, 1s. And the possible values of ml is going to be 0, okay? because we're going to go from l to minus l, going through 0, and the l is 0 itself. So that's why here you're going to have a value of ml of 0. So we're going to have one number of orbital in the subshell and a total orbital in the shell of 1, okay? because you can, we're going to have just ds. Now let's go to the second uh, shell. In the second shell, we have two possible values of n. Remember that the, M the ml, okay, basically the l is going to go from 0 to n minus 1. So start in 0, and n minus 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1. So it goes from 0 to 1. So that's why we have a possible of l of 0 and 1. When we have the zero, okay, we go now to determine the ML, the magnetic quantum, goes from zero minus L to L, but in this case the L is zero, so we're gonna be have a zero value, okay, and that's the same as we saw before. Now when we are in the L of one, the subshell is gonna be two P because now the L value of one is represented by P. And we are in the or in the uh, shell number two, so we are two p, and the ml is going to be one zero minus one. Why? Because remember that the ml goes from l to minus l going through zero, and the l is one, so it's going to be one zero minus one. So from this one, you're going to have three uh, subshells, 
and this one is going to have one. So at the end, we're going to have four type of orbitals in the shell number two. Three from the 2Ps and one from the 2S. If we go, for example, to level three, level three N, the possible L's go from zero to N minus one. So N minus one is three minus two. So it goes from zero, one, two. And this is going to be the same, but we're now we are in, in, in the shell number three. So it's three S because the zero is going to be an S. The one is going to be a P. The two is going to be a D. And all of these are going to be in level in the shell number three. So we're going to have three S, three P and three D. And the S has an ML value of just one ML value. So it's zero. And the P is going to have from L to minus L. So it goes from one going through zero and minus one. We have three possibles value of ML and the D. Okay. Three D has got, has a L value of two. This go from ML minus two, two to minus two. So it goes to two, one, zero, minus one and minus two. So we have five orbitals in this subshell. So at the end, if this shell number three, you're going to have five, I mean, nine orbitals, one from the S, three from 3P, and five from 3D. And that's how you obtain nine orbitals in this shell. And the same thing with number, um, the principal number of four. So let's talk now about the orbitals, the S orbital. The S orbital, the value L for S orbital is zero. And the shape of this orbital is spherical. It's very basically like a circle. Okay, you're gonna a sphere specifically, and the radius of base of this sphere is gonna increase with the value of n. As higher the principal quantum number, larger is gonna be that uh, sphere of the s orbital. Okay, we have one the one s here, the two s here, the three s here. So that means that the probability also increase, okay, as we go from this part to this one here, the area to obtain that electron. So there's a probability for the 1s to find the electron. When you have a 2s, you can have also the 1s because you need to fill further the, the, the smaller. So you have the 1s, the 2s, and here the 3s. These are probability. This represent 1s, 2s, and 3s. For an ns orbital, the number of peak is n. For an ns orbital, the number of nodes is n minus 1. So we have here an n of 1. Okay, so we don't have node here, but when we have, we are in the n2, that is this one, the nodes are going to be n minus 1, 2 minus 1. So we have one node between this area and this area. This node represents that you have a zero probability of finding the electron. So here we have. In this case, that's it, that is the 2s, the 2s, 2 minus 1 is going to be 1, 1 node. So this is the node. We have the 3s, so 3 minus 1 is going to be 2. So we have supposed to have two nodes. One is going to be here, and one is going to be here. These two areas or positions has basically a probability of 0 to find the electron. As n increase, the electron density is more spread out, and there is a greater probability of finding an electron further from the nucleus. So as we can see here, this is for 1s, this is for the 2s, the white area represents the node. So we have a very intense blue in the middle, that is the 1s, then a white area that is the node, this node here, and then an outer uh, sphere that is also a blue, intense blue, that is the 2s. Here we have a 3s, and the 3s we have two possible nodes. We have one node here, that is this white area, and also another one here that is, has another white area. So we have the 1s in the middle, the 2s around here, and the 3s, that is the outermost um, uh, area of this sphere. Okay. So the p orbitals, the value of L for p orbital is 1. And they have two lobes with a node between them. Basically, this is the representation of a p orbital. It looks like a dumbbell. Okay, so you have this is the the, the representation of the p orbital, and we can also uh, the, um, describe that as this. We're going to have a p orbital in each of the axes of our three-dimensional representation. So 
this represent the higher probability and also this one. So this point here between these two lobe, lobes is known as a node. We have a node here and the probability to find the electron there is zero. Whenever we talk about nodes, that means that the probability to find the electron at that specific point is zero. So we have a lobe in the z-axis, the y-axis, and the x as axis, okay? Then we have the d orbitals. The value of L for uh, d orbital is two, and we have four of the we have basically five different uh, subshells sub there. Four of the five d orbitals have four lobes. The other resembles a p orbital with a donut around the center. So these are the representation of p orbitals, five different shapes. Okay, these are basically the planes of the z. Uh, using also the Y, this is a Z and the X, the X and the Y, and this one also is the X and the Y, but in using the axis, and this is between the axis. So this is a four representation with four uh, different lobes, and this one has basically the dumbbell of the P and also a donut around the center. So these are four representation mathematically, that's the way that they ob observe this uh, uh, equation or, or form. Okay, these are just mathematical equations. Remember that these are just probabilities to find the electrons. So these are the five different shapes of the d orbitals. For the f orbitals, they are, the shapes are really, really complicated, so we're not going to show that in the text. But they have seven equivalent orbitals in the subshell. And the L is equal to 3. Now let's talk about the energy of orbitals, and let's use the one that we saw before, that is hydrogen. For a one electron hydrogen atom, orbitals on the same energy level have the same energy. Chemists call them degenerate orbitals. So here we have one orbital that has this energy, and here we have a cluster of different subshells, okay, that we have also with different energy. But we have found that as the number of electrons increase, so also does the repulsion between them. So they specifically have different kind of energies, okay, each of them. These are the ones that are called the degenerate orbitals because they have the same energy, okay, these three orbitals, for example. Here we have five degenerate uh, uh, subshells because they have the same energy, and also we have three here. Therefore, in atoms with more than one electron, not all orbitals on the same energy levels are degenerate. Orbital sets in the same sublevel are still degenerate. Energy levels start to overlap in energy. For example, the 4s is lower than the 3d. This is not uh, a, like a physical, uh, we can see this as, as a physical perspective. It's just with energy perspective. So if, you, if you're going to start to add electrons, remember that you start, or you must know that you start with the lowest level of energy. So you start putting electrons at this point, at the 1s, then go to the 2s, then go to the 2p, and then go to the 3s, 3p, and instead to go to the 3d, that is the next one, physically, the, 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 the next one with the lower energy is the 4s, as a lower energy than the 3d. So that's why you, we feel then the 4s, and then the 3d, and then the 4p. There is another quantum number that is known as the spin quantum number. In the 1920s, it was discovered that two electrons in the same orbital do not have exactly the same energy. The spin of an electron describes its magnetic field, which affects its energy. So even though they were in the same orbital, and it was suspected to have basically the same energy, they have a different energy due to the spin. This led to the quantum, the spin quantum number ms. And electrons can have a minus one or a positive, a minus one half or a positive uh, one half as the value of the ms. So if positive one half or minus one half. Those are the two possible uh, values for the MS. 
So the Pauli exclusion principle, no two electrons in the same atom can have exactly the same energy. Therefore, two non, no two electrons in the same atom can have identical sets of quantum numbers. This means that every electron in, our, in an atom must defer at least one of the four quantum numbers value. So we have the N, the L, the ML, and the MS. So each electron is going to have a specific four numbers, okay? And it can have the same number as another electron. They, can't, they, they need to, have, to be different in at least just one. Let's talk about the electron configuration. The way electrons are distributed in atoms is called the electron configuration. The most stable organization is the lowest possible energy called the ground state. Each component consists of a number of a number denote, denoting the energy level. So this number denotes the energy level. Here this represents the four energy level. A letter denoting the type of orbital. The P is a type of orbital and a superscript denoting the number of electron in those orbitals. So we have five electrons in the P orbital. So we have five electrons in this 4P type of orbital. Here we have what is called the orbital diagram. The one before was known as the electron configuration. This one is basically the same thing. We're going to obtain basically the same information, but it's represented in another way. It's called the orbital diagrams. Each box, box in the diagram represents one orbital. Half arrow represents the electron. So we have here one electron and another electron here. The direction of arrow represents the relative spin of the electron. Remember the ML uh, value? When we have an ML of positive one half, most of the time we represent it pointing the arrow up, uh, upward. And when we have a minus one half, we uh, represent the electrons uh, with an arrow downward. So we have here two electrons per each box. We can have a maximum of two electrons per box. So this one is for lithium. This is the basically the, the orbital diagram for lithium. We have three electrons, so we have two in the 1s, and the next orbital is going to be the 2s, so it's going to be the 2s1. The Hans rule, it says that for degenerated orbitals, the lowest energy is attained when the number of electrons with the same spin is maximized. So what that means? That means that we have, for example, if we start here with lithium, we are going to have two in the 1s, and we're going to add one to the 2s. So this is the orbital diagram. This is the electron configuration. 1s2, 2s1. For beryllium, beryllium has atomic number of four. That means that it has four electrons also because it's a neutral element. So we have two electrons in the 1s orbital and two electrons in the 2s orbital. So that means that we're going to have a 1s2 and a 2s2. Boron is has uh, atomic has an atomic number of five so that means that we have five electrons so we're going to have two in the 1s two and the 2s and one in the 2p so that means we're going to have 1s2 2s2 2p1 the next one is carbon and in carbon we're going to add two in the 1s two and the 2s and instead of add, adding two electron in this first box we're going to split them because electrons are particles with negative charge. And that means that we, if we put two electrons here, there's going to be repulsion between them. And at the same time, we're going to have two spaces with the same energy. So it's better to put this electron separate. So in that way, they don't uh, experience that repulsion between them. And they are still in orbitals with same energy. Okay, so instead of putting them in the same box, we need to put them separate. So that's why we have a one here, one electron in this 2p, and one electron in this 2p. This is the orbital diagram, but in the electronic configuration, we're going to have a 1s2, 2s2, and these two electrons are in the 2p, so it's 2p2. Okay, so in the electron configuration, we can represent in which of them uh, ship shelf they are, but we have two of them that are these two. And nitrogen is seven, so we're going to have two and the 2s, 
two and I mean two in the one s, two in the two s, so we have four. So we need to put three more in the two p's, and we're gonna add one in each one. So we're gonna have a two three p. So as can we see here in the electronic configuration, we have one s two, two s two, and two p three. And the orbital diagram, we need to split them. Now for the for um, the next one, oxygen that is eight. We're gonna put two two, and then we don't have any more places to put that electron, so we pair it here. So it should be like two here, two here, two electrons here, one and one. That was for that that should be for oxygen. And then it's gonna be one s two, two s two, two p four. Okay, but in that way we don't have any other place to put that electron. So with, at that point we start to pair them. Okay, as well as here with neon is ten. We're gonna have put two here, two here. And then six here, so we can have a total of ten electrons, and this will be a one s two, two s two, two p six. Now for sodium, sodium is eleven, so that means that we have a two here, two here, one s two, two s two, and here you're going to have a two p six, and then three s one. So this is the electronic configuration of uh, sodium: one s two, two s two, two p six. Or 3s1. Also, neon is part, and we're gonna see this in the next uh, slide, but I want to introduce pretty fast here. Neon is a gas novel. That means that every element of the periodic table wants to have the same electronic configuration of a, the gas novel gas, so that's why they create this ions of cations or anion. But also, we have here, if we can see here, this is the electronic configuration of neon. You can see one S2, two S2, two P6. So we can substitute and put here a bracket with neon and then the three S1. We're gonna see that in the few next slide, but I just wanna introduce that here that you can also represent this as the element of neon and we put that in bracket and three S1 because that will represent the one S2, two S2, two P6. So this means that for a set of orbitals in the same sublevel, there must be one electron in each orbital before pairing and the electrons have the same spin as much as possible. So condensed electron configuration. Remember when I talk about the uh, neon in, uh, in brackets? So this is the electronic configuration for sodium. It could be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, but also all of that, the 1s2, 2s, 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6 is the electronic configuration for neon. So you can represent also the electronic configuration for sodium as this. Element in the same group of periodic table have the same number of electrons in the outermost sh uh, shell. These are the valence electrons. The filled inner shell electrons are called the core electrons. These include completely filled D or F subshells. We write a shortened version of an electron configuration using brackets around a novel gas symbol and listen, li listening only valence electrons. So the only elements that could be in brackets are going to be the novel gas symbol. So in the periodic table, we fill orbitals in increasing order of energy. Different blocks on the periodic table correspond to different type of orbitals. This, the first two uh, groups here are known as the S block. Okay, this basically the pink one that is the uh, representative elements also are the P blocks. This one and the ones in the middle that are the orange and also this uh, beige color or the ten are basically the transition elements and the lanthanides and actinides. So these are inner transition elements. As you can see here, you start with the 1s, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and then from the 4s, you go to the 3d, and then the 4p, then the 5s, the 4d, and the, 5p, and the 5p. So as you can see here, if you are in the level 4, you're going to go from 4s, and then you're going to have the 3d. You're going to be 1 before in the in the inner transitional element uh, the representative element or the I mean the transition elements you're gonna be one number before the one that you have 
in that level. So here you have in, in the fourth level, 4S, you're going to then fill the 3 at 3D and then the 4P. So the 5S, then you're going to, once you fill the 5S, you're going to fill the 4D. You're going to, the D is going to be always one behind, is what I'm trying to say here. The same thing with the F, with the F going to be two behind. So we're going to have the 6S, 4F, 5D, and 6P. So we have some anomalies when we are doing this uh, electronic configuration. Some irregularities occur when there are enough electrons to half fill S and D orbitals on a given row. Okay, And for example, chromium, chromium is one of those anomalies. The configuration, the, the correct configuration is, is argon 4S1 3D5 instead of argon 4S2 3D4. Because it's more stable, it has been found that it's more stable to have half a fill of those orbitals. So the maximum here is going to be 2, the half is going to be 1. The maximum in D is going to be 10, so the half is going to be 5. So this, that's why this is the correct configuration for chromium. This occurs because the 4S and the 3D orbitals are very close in energy, and they can, and that, that electrons from the S can jump for the 3D. These anomalies occurs in the F block atoms with F and the orbitals as well. Okay, so it's, oh, you can see that anomaly also with the F blocks and the D. And this will be uh, all the information, all the, the topics for chapter number six, electronic structure of atoms.